By way of update and uh, something that I'd like to get on your prayer list, uh, many of you know that Levi and Emily Ponchek, our middle school pastor and his wife, uh, were expecting a baby, and they went in on Tuesday to deliver that little baby and um, discovered that uh, the baby's heart was enlarged. And so they had to airlift the baby to Sacred Heart, and uh, the baby's been in the um, uh, Sacred Heart um, NICU there, and uh, they've been um, treating that that uh, little um, Elias is his name, and um, and things are working. Things are moving in the right direction. Just got a great update from Levi, just even as we have been in uh, this gathering this morning, that um, things are progressing in a, in a positive way. And so I just want to, would you put Elias on your prayer list? And just let's pray for Elias. Let's pray for uh, Levi and Emily, that God would just continue to... Um, uh, that they would sense his sustaining power in their life and that they would know that as they walk through this season that um, they're not walking through it alone. So thanks for doing that. Um, I'm, I'm really excited today that, that we've got a guest speaker. Uh, in fact, the whole reason why the Rima clan moved to North Idaho is because of this guy. Uh, it was back in March of uh, 1999, can you believe that? 20 years ago, my phone rang, and it was this guy, and he said, listen, um, I'm on a staff here, and we're looking at planting a new church. We would like to sit down with you and talk to you about the possibility of you moving your family to North Idaho, joining our team, and then planting this new church. And so that began a conversation that resulted in us picking up and moving here in July of 1999 and um, engaging on this adventure. This, this would have never happened apart from my friend picking up the phone and saying, would you be willing to prayerfully consider the possibility that Coeur d'Alene might be in your future? And so we did that, and I'm so grateful that I did not miss um, that opportunity and this adventure. It's been such an amazing journey for us, and it would have not happened had it not been for my friend Terry Gurno. So would you please, would you please join with me and welcome Terry Gurno to the platform today? everybody how are you I love being being able to uh, speak in my own church because I don't have to go anywhere fly anywhere drive anywhere well I did drive a little ways about five minutes so uh, not bad I like that but I just love being here being a part of this church I just want you to know I love Lake City I really do I love its mission I love its focus I, I, I love the way that it lives it out week after week. It, for me, it's exciting to be a part of a community like this and to be able to do that with you. Uh, it's just there's something that, uh, that I just really enjoy about it. So it's really good to be here. <clears throat> and uh, I want to talk, you know, this is mentioned every week. This is a next step card. Uh, it's in the front of your seat or behind you if you're sitting in the front. And I love this because I believe that in life, no matter where you are, if it's personal, relational, spiritual, financial, whatever, um, there is a next step for all of us. How many of you know that we are not done growing yet? That <laughs> we, we want to get there. <laughs> we thought when we graduated high school or college or whatever, we thought we were done. And what we realized is we were only beginning. I remember I had a professor in college that said, the more I learned, he, was, he, had his, he has a PhD, he said, the more I learned, the more I, how, uh, I realized how ignorant I am. We are always learning. There's, there's a next step. And I, what, I, what I really love about, uh, again, Lake City and just um, learning and processing in general is that I believe that weekly we receive information and it's designed for application. In other words, we've got to apply it to our lives, and when we do, we experience transformation. Transformation personally, transformation um, relationally, transformation spiritually. So information for application for transformation. And I just, um, I, I really uh, enjoy that. I enjoy that process of being challenged and continuing to grow and knowing that for all of us, no matter where you're at, there's a next step. And this morning, I want to talk about our, a next step, and it's simply forgiveness. 
forgiveness. Forgiveness, this next step, I don't know even what that word brings up inside of you emotionally. I don't know if I say that word, if it just drains you or if it excites you and fills you with, I, I don't know. But I do know that on both ends of the spectrum and in between, that just saying that word can produce those kinds of feelings. You know, I learned something when I was in eighth grade. Uh, there was a group of us uh, one summer that we had nothing to do. There was like eight of us. And we were sitting around wondering what to do. And when I realized all of us had BB guns, uh, the kind that you could pump up, and uh, I said, hey, let's all go get our BB guns. And they did. We came back, and I said, let's shoot each other. I mean, that's, that would, that's what we should do. So we, we decided to have a BB gun war, and it wasn't teams. It was just everybody against everybody, last man standing, stuff like that. So we made a rule. You know, you could pump these up, you know, 10 times and actually do some sort of damage to a small animal uh, if you wanted. And, um, and so we said, hey, let's safety first, three pump maximum, you know, just let's be safe. So we decided, I mean, honestly, we did this and we all broke up and we counted and like, ready to go. We started looking for each other and stuff like that. And I remember get, getting stung. I just felt, I had no idea what it was, but it stung right here so much. And I just let off this yell. And it just, people come, you know, they, they, they came when they heard that to see what was happening. By the time they got there, man, I just had blood gushing out of my, I mean, just, it was just everywhere, all over my, and they looked at me and went, oh my gosh, you know, and like, what do we do? Let's take them to Dave's house, because Dave's parents weren't home. So, <laughs> so they took me to Dave's house. Dave says, get in the bathtub. I don't want all this going all over my house. So I'm literally eighth grade, BB gun, standing in the bathtub, just, you know, bleeding. So we got the bleeding to stop, put a bandage on it, and then I said, you know what, <clears throat> you know, we probably shouldn't do this, right? Information, application, transformation. This <laughs> probably is not a good idea. So we all went home. When I got home, my mom was there. She saw the blood. She saw my BB gun. She saw the bandage. She said, what happened? And I said, oh, no big deal. We were messing around. I fell, hit a stick, punctured my neck, bled a little bit. No big deal. She goes, really? I said, yep. And okay, mom, I'm going to go rest for a bit. So I went into my room <clears throat> and I'm just like, oh man, reliving the events, and my mom comes in, she says, hey, I just wanted to let you know that our friend, Larry and Mary, their dog died, and I said, oh, okay, that's, that's too bad. She says, you want to know how? And I said, yeah. She goes, well, someone shot it with a BB gun. The BB got into the bloodstream, traveled to the heart, and as soon as it hit the heart, it killed it. I went, are you kidding me? She said, nope. And I said, get me to the hospital. <laughs> Moms are smart, aren't they? <laughs> they know what's up. I'll never forget that moment. Now, I have a scar right here from when they went in and dug it out. And as my children were growing up, every once in a while, they'd say, hey, Dad, what's that scar from? And I'd tell them, and years later, it's funny, but at the moment, that was not funny. But here's what I've realized. This is my takeaway from eighth grade. Everybody has scars. How many of you have a scar somewhere? When you look at that scar, do you remember that event, what happened? Do you remember that story? I do, too. And at the time, maybe it wasn't funny, but maybe 10, 20 years later, maybe it's a little bit funny, maybe it's never funny. But there's always a story. We have scars, and we see them, and when other people see them, they say, hey, what happened? And all of a sudden, we're reminded, and we relive that story. Well, the truth is, all of us have experienced pain that leaves scars that you and I cannot see. Everybody has a story. Everybody has these um, moments in their life, these painful moments that leave scars, and yet we're able to go out in public, maybe even attend church, and people don't see them, and we're able to appear at times that we're okay, and then sometimes we're not okay. I uh, grew up with a... <clears throat> father who was an alcoholic and very abusive, and our home was not, um, it was not a safe place, a lot of abuse, saw my mother um, beat several times, almost to the point of death, and being just a little boy, feeling helpless to do anything, being afraid, all of us, all of, all of my siblings, there's, there's five of us all together, and being afraid in our room, going to bed, and just being afraid in the night. 
And the interesting thing was, we never talked about it as kids. We never said, hey, how you doing? Are you okay? Hey, are you hurt? Hey, can I help? We, we never talked about it, ever. We never talked about it with my mom, and my mom never talked about it with us. When my dad left when I was 10, it was like a relief. We felt like we could be safe again. We didn't have to worry. We had different worries. We, we worried about how we were going to eat. We worried about how we were going to go to the doctors. My mom didn't drive. My mom, um, when we were growing up, even uh, through junior high school, she was a waitress, worked double shifts, seven days a week. She had to um, go on a neighbor's door um, weekly and line up rides with neighbors, and she would pay them gas because we didn't have a car, and she didn't even have a license. And so this was what we grew up in, <clears throat> and as a result, I, I don't know if it was a result or not, but it just happened that we, we were not emotionally connected as a family. We never said, I love you. We never hugged. We never said, we're there for you. And I can't explain why. I don't know why. I think and it was all of us. None of us were like that. And so uh, growing up, <clears throat> Even in, as an adult, you know, I, I never told people I loved them. Even when I thought a lot of them, or was I, I just didn't. And here's why. I've tried to explain this to my wife. It emotionally hurt to try to say those words. It's hard to explain. I don't know. Some of you might be able to relate to that, but it just emotionally hurt. <clears throat> and I had friends. Um, I had friends that were adults that, uh, that I, you know, that I knew, they could say, in fact, Pastor Mike's one of them. Mike, I remember one time, it was, I, re, I remember where it was, too. Uh, we were uh, at the parking lot, in the parking lot of Spokane First Assembly. We, we had spent some time together, and he was leaving, and I was leaving, and he came, and he hugged me, and he said, I love you. And I was like, yeah, right on. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I, I, I did not know how to respond to that. And he just kept doing it. He just kept telling me years and years and years. He just kept it. Hey, I love you. I'd say, right on. Back at you. Ditto. Talk to me. <laughs> so it was very hard for me to say that. And, and it was also hard for me to trust. It was hard for me to trust. As a matter of fact, this, this you know, even affected my marriage. I remember uh, one time when I was in college, uh, my wife and I were only married for like a year and a half or so, two years. And I was working at Costco, I was attending Northwest uh, College, which is university now, and my wife dropped me off, and, and uh, she, uh, you know, I told her, hey, I'm off at 8.15, and so at 8.15, I came out, she wasn't there, and so I walked home. I wasn't mad, it's just that my dad would take me places and never pick me up. I, I wasn't mad, I was used to it, I just... Walked home. I, in fact, I got home before her. I wasn't mad. I just said, hey, honey, how you doing? She goes, where have you been? My gosh, do you realize how well I've been looking for you? I said, honey, man, I'm sorry. She was a few minutes late. I just thought she wasn't coming. It impacts us. These painful events impact us in so many different ways. You know, pain's inevitable, but I, leave that, I believe that misery is optional. Misery is when we experience pain, and then we hold on to that, and we allow that pain to control our lives. That's misery. When someone that you care about hurts you, you can't hold on to that, you can hold on to anger. You can hold on to bitterness. You can even have thoughts of revenge. Or you can embrace forgiveness and move forward. Those really are our choices. That's what's out there. We are going to be hurt. We're going to be hurt by the people that we love and the people that love us. 
In fact, you know, um, when I uh, do a wedding, I usually, will, and I did one yesterday, and I, and I said this yesterday, I said, you know, um, I'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the great love chapter, and love is patient, kind, and all that. It's not jealous, boastful, anger, you know, angry. And, and I'll read that, and I'll say, you know, this is a, a perfect picture of what love is, and I really believe love is this. Love is this. Here's the challenge. We are imperfect people. And when our imperfections collide, life gets messy and life gets painful. And it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. I remember when I was getting to know my wife as, you know, we were just building our relationship. One night we were talking and, and uh, Nancy was just asking me about growing up. And I was like 22 at the time. She was asking me about growing up and I started talking to her and she comes from a completely different background and everything and <clears throat> she, you know, never experienced any of that kind of stuff that I did. And, and, and as I was sharing just what happened, it's just, I, man, something deep inside, deep inside of me broke that I had no idea was there. And I mean, I sobbed. I sobbed like a baby. I had no, I couldn't control it. I, I, I didn't know it was there. I didn't know it was coming. But it was there. And it was just the right questions that brought all of that out. And I think we walk around with it. This is one of the things when we choose not to forgive and we hold on to that. Now, I want you to know something. Sometimes we hold on to things that hurt us. We get angry because that's comfortable. That's comfortable to be angry. That's my right. I can do that. And it is. I, I'd never say that it's not. <clears throat> But I just remember what that moment showed me about, you know, me growing up and what was inside of me, and I didn't even know it. And so I just want to talk about some very practical things about forgiveness because it's the greatest gift that God has given us, and it's the greatest gift that we can extend to ourselves and to others. And it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. I heard someone once say, I don't know who it was, it's the people that, are, uh, that we love the most, we tend to hurt the most. And I don't like that saying, but I just want you to know that has been true in my own life. I don't like it. <clears throat> and I don't know why that is. But I'm also grateful for another saying I heard, and I do know who said this, and that was John Maxwell, and he said, I want the people closest to me to think the most of me. And that's just been something I've remembered and said, you know, God, help me to do that. But I just want to talk about forgiveness because it is, for many of us, our next step. And if it's not your next step today, it will be tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. I just want to, yeah, just a couple of things. Number one, what we need to realize is forgiveness is one-sided. Forgiveness is about me. It's what I need to do. It's about me. It's what I need to do. <clears throat> Jesus was walking, and he saw a fig tree, and there was no figs on it, so he cursed it. And on the way back, they looked at that, and it says in Mark chapter 11, it says, and this isn't in your notes, but I have a verse that is, early next morning, as they were walking along the road, they saw the fig tree, and it was dead, all the way down to its roots. And Peter remembered what he, had, uh, what he happened to say to Jesus. Look, teacher, the fig tree you, you cursed has died. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. I assure you that whoever tells this hill to get up and go throw itself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes what he says will happen, it will be done for him. But then he goes on, this, you know, these next two verses is really what I want to get to. For this reason I tell you, when you pray... And ask for something, believe that you have received it, and you will be given whatever you ask. And when you stand to pray, this is it right here, forgive anything you may have against anyone. You forgive anything that you have against anyone. So if that's pain, if that's anger, if that's bitterness, he says, whatever that is, you forgive them. 
This is not about them coming and saying, will you forgive me, I'm so sorry. This isn't about that. This is about us taking care of us first. Forgive. So that your Father in heaven will forgive the wrongs you have done. How many of you know it's easy to focus on the wrongs of others and what they have done? It, it's easy. It requires no effort. But it does take some effort to focus on us first. And that's what we need to focus on. <clears throat> God modeled this for us. You know, in the beginning, <clears throat> you know, man ate of the, the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and his eyes were opened. And when you read in Genesis, it says that God came walking, they heard his voice walking in the cool of the day in the garden, and the man and the woman, they were afraid, and they hid themselves. This is, this is what it does when we hurt someone, when we sin against them, it, it brings separation. And there was this game of hide and seek that began and continues to this day, where man hides from God. When he says, why did you, know, why did you hide? He said, because I was ashamed. This is what we carry with us. We carry shame. And we hide, and we hide from God, and we hide from one another, and we hide from our spouse, and we hide from our children, and we hide from our best friends. I think one of the saddest, hardest, most gut-wrenching lines in the whole Bible is when God says in that encounter, where are you? It just breaks my heart. Where are you? And so, so we hide, but... And, and, and so there was this separation and this isolation from God. But notice this in Romans. This is in your notes. But you can write this verse down, Romans 5 out. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. God made the first move. God said, I'm going to move. I'm going to do this. I'm going to resolve this. I'll die for mankind. It wasn't because we did something first. God made the first move. It, it, it's about me. It's about my health. It's about my restoration. It's about the ability for me to experience inner peace. <clears throat> George Herbert, who was a priest and poet in the early 1600s, said, he who cannot forgive breaks the bridge over which he himself must pass we talk about forgiveness it is the message of the cross but it is hard to live out too often we want the other person to move first that's not what what this is about this morning this is about us recognizing that and us taking that first step it's about me so, so next one is forgiveness is a decision Forgiveness is a decision. Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. He says, when you pray, do not use a lot of meaningless words as the pagans do who think that their gods will hear them because of their prayers are long. Do not be like them. Your father already knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. And we, most of us learned this when we were young, right? Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Say it with me. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Forgive us our tres trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. Matthew 6, 14 and 15, Jesus says, If you forgive others the wrongs they have done to you, your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive the wrongs that you have done. Forgiveness is a decision. Forgiveness is a decision, and we make it, and we make it intentionally because we know 
it's, it's, it starts with me. It doesn't start with anybody else. It starts with me. <clears throat> Forgiveness, when we choose to forgive, it's a decision to let go of resentment, bitterness, anger, and thoughts of revenge. That's what we're choosing to do. And you know what? We can live so long with that that it becomes difficult to think about living without it. But we make that decision. <clears throat> and that forgiveness then can loosen the grip that all of those things have on you and free you from the person that harmed you. Forgiveness isn't me just forgetting about what happened or excusing what happened. That's not what we're talking about here. But it is a choice to let go. It's a choice to move forward. It's a choice to become whole. In fact, I read this in Psychology Today, studies have shown forgiveness can lead to healthier relationships, improved mental health, less anxiety, stress, anger, and resentment, lower blood pressure, fewer symptoms of depression, a stronger immune system, improved heart health, and improved self-esteem. You want to take some vitamins? You want to get healthy? We need to practice you know, forgiveness. And again, I'm not saying it's easy. It's not. It's necessary. <clears throat> when we forgive, we are making a commitment to a process, a process to change, a process that goes like this. We recognize the value that forgiveness can have in my life and, and, and what it can do to liberate me and improve my relationships. It's identifying who needs to be forgiven in my life for the things that have happened. And then, and then it's considering joining some sort of a, a, a group, a support group, a, a life group. It's doing this as part of that process, including others. It's acknowledging your emotions about the harm that was done to you. It's acknowledging it. It's not forgetting it. It's not excusing it. It's not pretending it doesn't exist. It's acknowledging it and how it's impacted, in, uh, impacted you. And then it's choosing to forgive that person that's offended you. And then it's moving away from your side as a victim and releasing the control and the power that that person has over your life. These are some of the things, this is the process that forgiveness that we can go through. And, and some of you have gone through this process and you've experienced exactly what I'm talking about. And as you let go, as you let go of that bitterness, that anger, that, all of that stuff, they, you'll no longer be defined by the hurt that you've been carrying around for so long. And you might even find compassion for that other person. I don't know who said this, it says anonymous, but I, I, I feel like it's a really good quote. Forgiveness is me giving up my right to hurt you for hurting me. Because isn't this what we do when we're hurt? The old saying that hurt people hurt people. Okay, how honest do you want to be this morning? You guys want to be honest? You guys want to be really honest? And again, this is only about me. I've probably experienced as much hurt, maybe more, from Christians, people inside the church, than outside the church. I'm just being honest. We're people. Part of, the, part, of, part of it was, honestly, I had higher expect, I had unrealistic expectations for people in the church. I expected more. I thought they were somehow no longer the people they were. And they're not. They're progressing, but they're still people. 
and they're still imperfect people. And when our imper imperfections meet, guess what? Life gets messy even here. <clears throat> what I've realized is hurt people hurt people. And I think, honestly, as a pastor, those people hurt me because I hurt them. No, I didn't have that kind of clarity at the time, nor did I have the emotional, physical, spiritual, or relational energy, strength, or health to work through that at the time. But there did come a place in my life when I said, I'm going to forgive. and Because I, I needed it. Because I was um, not living my life the way that I wanted. It was impacting the people that I love and I care about. And I just came to a place where I thought, I, I can't go on like this. No, I'm a Christian. Pastor. And yet that's where I was. I wasn't going to say this, but I thought, I'll say it anyways, then Mike and I can talk about it afterwards and tell me if he appreciated it or not. But there was a time when, when this hurt spilled over into mine and Mike's relationship. Do you remember that? And I'll tell you what, it was painful. And it was painful on both sides. And that lasted for a couple of years. Now, we still talked several times on the phone that week. I mean, every week. Not just that week, every week. But we were just going through the motions. It was, we talked because we were friends, and yet there was this unforgiveness. And I, I remember the night when Mike and I were talking, or the day, and Mike says, you know what, I'm, you know, with a lot of passion, I'm sick of this. And I said, no, I'm sick of this. And I remember we said, okay, we're meeting, and we're going to throw down tonight. <laughs> no, we really weren't going to throw down. We were going to talk. <laughs> That's what I mean. And we talked. We talked for hours that night, and God just healed our relationship. And do you want to know what? That was all born out of misunderstanding. That's it. But we all have our lens, and we look at our life through our lens, and we look at either what's done or not done, or what's said or not said to us. So I'm grateful for that phone call that day, Pastor. God's restored our relationship. And I'm just saying that because this is real, you guys. This is where we do this to each other. It happens. We're people. I'm not excusing it. I'm not trying to explain it. I'm just saying it's reality. And here's the last point. Forgiveness is ongoing. There's no limits to forgiveness. Peter, um, in your notes, you'll see Matthew 18, it says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, if my brother sins, keeps on sinning against me, how many times do I have to forgive him? Seven times? No, not seven times. Peter thinks he's off the hook. He's thinking, awesome. You know? And he says, but 70 times seven. Just blew the doors off his thinking. In other words, he was thinking, you know, there's no limit. It is on going and it's because we're people and we we're in relationships we're imperfect and life is messy and life is painful so there's no limit there's no limit we're not going to get done we're not going to graduate from this this will always be a next step always <clears throat> so it's a process that we get in that has no limit but what happens if you don't feel like you can forgive somebody. <clears throat> then I, just a couple of things. They're not in your notes. You can write them down. You can listen to the podcast. But number one, practice empathy. Try to look at it from their point of view. It's hard to do because we're so focused on our point of view. This is hard. But if we can, try to practice empathy. <clears throat> Ask yourself why that this person would have done this thing. Reflect on times when you've hurt others and you've been forgiven. And then 
Write in a journal. Pray. Talk with somebody. Talk with a close friend. Talk with a pastor. Um, talk to your, your life group. Talk to somebody and begin to talk about this. You know what? If, if, if you feel like you can't forget, then I think that is a great place to just say, just to admit and own. Own that place. Um, if, that's, if that's where you're at, just own that. I, I can't forget. God can handle that. God can move you through. People will pray with you. But let's acknowledge it. And then let's com- talk. And let's work through that process. <clears throat> Forgiveness is not a guarantee to reconcile relationships or restore relationships. Uh, Because there's forgiveness, it doesn't mean that that's going to happen. I remember I was speaking at a guy on forgiveness years ago, and I walked out towards the back door, and I saw a guy making a beeline for me. It was like he was power walking. And I thought, okay, I don't know what that's about, but it's something, you know. And I got back there, and he says, I want to ask you something. And I said, yeah, go ahead. He goes, do I have to forgive someone if they don't ask me for it? I said, no, you don't have to. You don't have to do anything you don't want to. However, you can. You can choose to. And that's what forgiveness is all about. It's you choosing before you're asked. It's letting go of that emotion that's inside of you in the question that you just asked me. you got to make that choice. <clears throat> Reconciliation may happen, but there's no guarantee that it will happen. You can't force somebody to forgive you. We have to move through this process in our own time, but we must move. Move forward. Again, information, application, transformation. Move through the process. Harriet Nelson said, forgive all who have offended you, not for them, but for yourself. At the end of the day, this is about your health. This is about your life. This is about your peace. This is about your ability to love. I'm so grateful that I'm not, I'm not great at it, but I, I am able to tell people I love them now. Let me tell you something. That was a huge step for me. Not everyone. I'm, I'm better with hugging than I was years ago. I'm grateful for that. <clears throat> when I was in college, I was... Uh, 21 at the time, my dad called me. I hadn't talked to him for years. He was living 80 miles away from me and said, son, I want you to come up for Christmas. So I went up and uh, I, I, in my mind, I imagined that we would just spend this really cool night together. We'd probably share a meal. I bought him a gift. I wanted to give it to him. And I just wanted to say, hey, what's gone on the last 10, 11 years? What have you been doing? Where have you gone? You know, all this kind of stuff. I just had this, imag- this idea of connecting with my dad. And so but when I got up there, that's not what happened. I knocked on the door. He opened and said, follow me. I, and he just left. He started walking. So I got in my truck. I followed him. We went to this house. Wild party. It was, I was so angry. Loud music, drugs, alcohol. I was so angry. I turned around. I walked out. My dad followed me. And he said, you know, where are you going? I said, I'm leaving. I said, you know, I'm so ashamed of you. I've been more of a father to you than you've ever been to me. And don't ever call me again until you're sober. I don't ever want to see you. I, I, I just had it. It was, it was just, just so hard. And I got in my car and I drove home. And as I'm on I, I, uh, I-5 uh, driving south, going back to school, all of a sudden they started having these thoughts. And I knew it was the Holy Spirit because I wouldn't think about this myself. But I started thinking about my dad. I started thinking about him growing up um, as a child. And I knew that he had experienced what I experienced. His parents were alcoholics. My dad was severely beat on several occasions. He experienced exactly in his home what I, and for whatever reason, I was able to identify with him coming from the same pain, sharing that. It didn't excuse it. It didn't make it right. But for whatever reason, in that moment, I was able to identify with him and his pain. And as I'm driving down the road, my eyes fill with water. Now, I'm in Bible college. So I had this idea and understanding that God was doing something inside of me that I had never experienced, not not like this. A year passes. 
my dad calls me up, says, you want to come? And I said, yes. So I go back up there thinking the same thing, got my gift, hoping things had changed, and it didn't. It was the exact same scene, except it was at his house. I didn't know these people. Again, loud drugs, alcohol. But this year, I sat there. My dad hadn't changed, but I had changed. And I uh, sat there for a while, a few hours later. I didn't really talk to a lot of people, but I just, I tried not to um, be mean. I mean, I wasn't mean. I just sat there. And uh, I got up and said, hey, Dad, I, I've got to get going. And so he followed me out and he said, son, are you ashamed of me? And I said, no, Dad. I love you. Now, you need to know, I didn't, I didn't feel that. That wasn't a feeling. But here's what I realized in that year. If my dad never did one thing for me, not one, he gave me my life. And I loved my life. And I told him I loved him. And he hugged me. And he said, son, I'm going to get help. And I said, dad, I believe you. And you can preach all the sermons that you want. But you know what? When it came to my dad, I just had to tell him, I love you. I didn't have to tell him I was ashamed or you're bad or whatever. <clears throat> I'm going to get help, son. I said, I believe you. I drove away a couple of months later. I get a call on my floor at the dorm. Gurno, it's for you. I go up there. It's my dad. He said, son, I'm calling you for a couple of reasons. Number one, I was told I had to tell somebody. Number two, I thought of you. Number three, I gave my life to Jesus Christ this morning. I... <clears throat> two months later I baptized him <laughs> life's not perfect people aren't perfect God's given us forgiveness it starts with me it's a decision it's ongoing <clears throat> I don't know where you're at I don't know your story but I know you have one I know you have scars people can see and you have scars that people can't see but whatever your next step is, I want to pray with you before you leave that whatever that is in forgiveness, that you would make a commitment to take it. And that commitment, may, that first step may be saying, I can't. God can deal with that. It may be forgiving yourself. It may be forgiving somebody else. Or may, your first step might say, God, forgive me. Whatever that is, I want to pray for you. So, Father, thank you so much for your love for us, for the way that you never give up on us. We are no surprise to you. You know us, everything about us, and you love us. And God, I thank you for the gift of forgiveness that you've given us to experience personally, but now, God, to extend. And I pray we're, no matter where everybody's at today, that you would all help us our, take our next step in forgiveness. In fact, if you're here this morning and you say, you know what, Terry, I'm going to take a step in forgiveness. You're not telling me what that is, but you're going to take that step, a step. Do me, with heads bowed and eyes closed, just do me a favor and just lift your hand up. Just lift, you just lift it up. You're, you say, I'm going to do this. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your honesty. Thank you so much. Hands going up. We're not alone. We are not alone. So, Father, you saw the hands go up, and I just pray, whatever that is, that God, this week, the day to, starting today, that they would take that step. Whatever that means to them, their circumstances. And, God, you would give them the strength, and you would reassure them in the process. And God, you would allow them to exchange bitterness for peace, anger for love, that you would fill them with hope and joy, and that you would restore them from the inside out, and that, God, we would be a reflection of your message of forgiveness to those in our lives, no matter where we go. God, do what you, only you can do and what no man can do. Thank you so much. 
In Jesus' name, amen.